Laying the groundwork for a third summit between President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Seoul reveals the five-member delegation that will travel to Pyongyang on Wednesday. Back to business, the second regular session of South Korea's National Assembly since the inauguration of the Moon administration opens for a period of 100 days. We have the details. Plus, the curtain comes down on the 2018 Asian Games in Indonesia with a grand closing ceremony. Let's begin with the ongoing diplomacy between the two Koreas. We now know the team South Korea will send to Pyongyang this week, and it includes some familiar faces. The delegation is tasked with laying the groundwork for a planned inter-Korean summit later this month. Cha Sang-mi starts us off. Seoul's top office on Sunday named the high-level officials who will be dispatched to Pyongyang to work out the details for the third summit between President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The five-member group traveling to Pyongyang will be headed by National Security Advisor Chong Yu as chief envoy. The others are key officials in charge of inter-Korean affairs. The National Intelligence Service Chief Seo Hun, Vice Minister of Unification Chan hye sung NIS Deputy Chief Kim sang Kyun, and Yoon gon Young, the Presidential Secretary for State Affairs. The delegation will set off for North Korea on the 5th via the direct route on the western side of the peninsula and they'll return to the south the same day. In view of the importance of their visit, the delegates are the same as last time. These five officials went to Pyongyang in March to arrange the historic Panmunjom summit. Their main agenda, the spokesman said, is to discuss ways to develop inter-Korean ties in a way that does not violate UN sanctions and to find a comprehensive way to implement the April 27th Panmunjom Declaration, namely to officially end the war and denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. As for why the visit will only last a day, the Blue House said that unlike their first visit in March, the two Koreas have built trust since then, making a one-day visit possible. The spokesman didn't say whether the team will be meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Cha sang Arirang News. So September is going to be a crunch period in Seoul and Washington's engagement with North Korea. And much of the immediate pressure is on that South Korean delegation that will be heading to Pyongyang in a couple of days. Our Kim hyo Sun has more on what's likely to be a rather delicate balancing act. South Korea's delegation to Pyongyang helped lay the groundwork for the landmark summit between the leaders of North Korea and the U.S. in June. He expressed his eagerness to meet President Trump as soon as possible. While the delegation consists of the same members, they face a much more complex task this time. The delegation has to convince Pyongyang and Washington, who are locked in a stalemate, to start making some concessions to get diplomacy moving again. The delegation's visit is to help the North and the U.S. reach an agreement on either submitting a full report of the North's nuclear arsenal after declaring the end of the Korean War or agreeing on exchanging both a nuclear report and a war-ending declaration. Seoul's delegation also needs to coordinate closely with Washington. While the Moon administration has stressed that improved inter-Korean relations will help solve the North's nuclear issue, Washington has made it clear that denuclearization should go hand in hand with the development of relations between the two Koreas. Analysts are concerned that Seoul-Washington relations could be on shaky ground if the U.S. opposes the proposals South Korea makes to the North, including resuming tourism to Mount Kumgang and economic cooperation between the two nations. It's crucial for South Korea to reach an agreement with the U.S. on the details of the additional incentives that may be presented to the North in order to prevent any disagreement between the Allies while persuading the North. The trade tensions between China and the U.S., as well as Chinese President Xi Jinping's possible visit to Pyongyang this month, as the regime celebrates the 70th anniversary of its founding next week, are also issues the delegation needs to consider. Kim yo san Arirang News. Washington's new special envoy for North Korea will soon visit America's allies here in Northeast Asia. Local news outlet YTN reports 
that Stephen Began will soon embark on his trip, which includes stops in Seoul and Tokyo. His South Korean counterpart is the Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs at the Foreign Affairs Ministry, Ido Hoon. CNBC says Began is an unconventional politician who lacks much foreign policy experience, but added that he may have the precise quality needed during these negotiations, the ability to have the ear of President Trump. Now, with North Korea's 70th Foundation Day coming up on September 9th, satellite imagery shows the regime is set to stage yet another military parade. This comes as worries mount that diplomatic efforts on its denuclearization are stalling. Lee Sung Jae with the details. Parades have long been a way for North Korea to show off its military power to the world. Come September 9th, Pyongyang will host a number of major events for the 70th anniversary of the regime's founding, including a military parade. Based on commercial satellite imagery gathered by Planet Labs Incorporated, analysts say the parade is likely to be very similar to the one staged in February. But 38 North, a U.S. think tank devoted to analyzing North Korea, thinks otherwise. According to their analysis of satellite photos, North Korea has been readying for their parade since July, and the event is expected to be one of the largest, given the scale of preparation. Images show some 500 trucks used to transport troops parked outside a parade formation. It also found the shelters for troops are larger than the ones used in the preparation for the military parade to mark the 70th anniversary of the North Korean army in February. Satellite images dated August 22nd show the medium parade training ground full of tanks, self-propelled artillery, infantry carriers, anti-aircraft missiles, and rocket launchers. Other possible weapons to be showcased include coastal defense cruise missiles, as well as at least six solid-fuel, short-range ballistic missiles, possibly of a type first seen in February. However, analysts say there are no signs of ICBMs yet. They added that if ICBMs or other large missiles are present, they would likely remain hidden under cover in heavy equipment storage areas until the day of the parade. The parade is also expected to draw visits by foreign delegations, and for the first time in five years, a massive choreographed performance known as the Mass Games. Lee seung Arirang News. The second regular session of the National Assembly since the inauguration of the Moon Jae-in administration back in May 2017 will open today for 100 days. There is a packed schedule including speeches by political party representatives, government questioning sessions and inspections as well as the president's speech on next year's budget. Lawmakers are also likely to engage in some fierce debates on the government's budget proposal of 420 billion US dollars for 2019. Other issues include the ratification of the Panmunjom Declaration. South Korea's third largest political party has elected a former four-term lawmaker as its new leader. In his acceptance speech on Sunday, Son Hak-gyu vowed to unify the party and do his best to disrupt the two-party system that has long dominated South Korean politics. Kim Min-ji with the details. The minor opposition Padamida party has elected political veteran Son Hak-kyu as its new chair. At the party's national convention on Sunday, Son won a six-way race, getting a combined 27 percent of the vote. The former leadership had resigned after the party's defeat in the June local elections, in which it won no mayor or governor posts. Son, a former four-term lawmaker who also served as a chair of the now-ruling Democratic Party of Korea back in 2010 when it was the main opposition, will take the helm for the next two years. Let's work together to put the Padamide Party at the forefront of these efforts to give people hope and to help the country overcome its difficulties. The new party vowed first and foremost to bring about unity within the party. The Padamida party was launched through a merger of a center-right and a center-left party, which caused friction among some members due to regionalism and ideology. 
Son also promised to do everything possible to revamp the country's electoral system so that more diverse voices can be reflected in parliament and so that it's not controlled only by the two biggest parties as it is now. I will get rid of the imperialistic presidential system, which has caused people to suffer, and I will get rid of the two-party system that's built into our legislature. The Padamide Party will spearhead political reform as we bring together reform-minded conservatives and future-oriented progressives. The new chair will also be tasked with solidifying the party's identity. It's been criticized for failing to differentiate itself from either of the two bigger ones, and so it hasn't been able to stand out as an alternative. On top of that, the new leader will have to boost the party's single-digit approval rating and attempt to lead the party to victory at the 2020 general elections. Kim min Arirang News. South Korean steelmakers are pushing for an exemption from the Trump administration's steel import quota. POSCO and Hyundai Steel Company are asking to be left off the 70% annual import quota imposed by Washington, an exemption only granted to companies that are physically located in the US. According to the Federal Register, POSCO AAPC, which is POSCO's overseas affiliate, and Hyundai Steel USA have already filed requests. The Trump administration has imposed the 70% annual quota on steel imported from South Korea, but exempted it from additional tariffs of 25%. It's early September and that means it's recruitment season for many big South Korean companies. Graduates have spent years glossing up their resumes for this moment, but with the economy kind of sputtering along at the moment, we thought we'd take a look at the current employment trends and the outlook for the rest of 2018. For that, let's turn to our Goryeon Hee. Latest data from Korea's job market have not been very promising. But for young job seekers, every cloud has a silver lining. According to a recent survey, almost 70% of responding companies answered that they're looking forward to hiring college graduates during the latter half of this year. So how does that help potential job seekers? Let's take a look at a job fair that held various recruitment plans. Job seekers were lined up at a job fair held at a university in August to get the latest trends, recruitment procedures, and anything else related to the job market. There is a lot of information on the company's website, but I came here to learn what's not uploaded for the public, like job interview tips. I am about to graduate, so I am interested in how big companies are recruiting in the second half of 2018. By sectors, online portal Incruit says new jobs are highly expected in finance and insurance sectors in H2, by around 6.5 percent from the same period last year. Employment opportunities in information and communications also look brighter in the latter half of 2018, with an increase of around 7 percent on-year. This comes after the government expanded its budget spending to boost jobs that are related and relevant to the fourth industrial revolution. In fields that range from self-driving cars and drones to biotech, in addition to traditionally core industries for growth. According to industry sources, companies in biotechnology, semiconductors and finance are likely to hire the most this year. The consultant also said that applicants should think more than just writing resumes or cover letters when it comes to applying to a job. Many job seekers invest a lot of time in writing extensive resumes or cover letters. They don't think about the rest of the process. This includes personality or aptitude tests and interviews. People should evenly distribute their time in these three parts, not just focus on the beginning of the process. Last but not least, providing accessible job information is crucial. As such, experts recommend that the government should put more emphasis in creating platforms where businesses and job seekers can share valuable information. Koruni, Arirang News. Now, after more than two weeks of sporting action featuring the best athletes from across the continent, the curtain came down on the 18th 
Asian Games on Sunday with a glittering closing ceremony. Now, South Korea finished with 49 golds to rank third in the medal table behind China and Japan. That is 16 short of the country's target, but there were still plenty of reasons to celebrate. Won Jong Hwan reports. For the past 16 days, Jakarta and Palembang, the co-host cities of the 2018 Asian Games, hosted more than 11,000 athletes from 45 nations competing, 465 gold medals in 40 sports. On Sunday, the Games came to a triumphant close in Jakarta. If the opening ceremony wowed the audience for the richness of Indonesia's heritage, the closing ceremony was more modest in scale but extravagant in its liveliness. It was a celebration of athletes from different countries that highlighted the culture of not just Indonesia, but other Asian nations as well. Bonding the nations together was the power of music. K-pop superstars Icon and Super Junior took to the stage, turning the evening into a spectacular concert that was well-received by the crowd. But before the singers stole the show, some of the athletes came out to say goodbye to fans in Indonesia and thanked them for their support. While there wasn't a formal parade of athletes at the closing ceremony, the two Koreas marched in together just like they did at the opening ceremony. The two flag bearers, South Korean Choi Yo-won and North Korean Choi Il, came in hand in hand to big cheers. South and North Korea competed as one in three sports, canoeing, rowing and women's basketball. And they far outstripped expectations, winning four medals including a gold in women's dragon boat racing and a silver in women's basketball. Sending a congratulatory message to Indonesia for successfully hosting the Asian Games, South Korean President Moon Jae-in highlighted the performances by the joint Korean teams. He said he believes the deep sound of Arirang, Korea's most popular folk song, will bring the two together again. As the curtain came down in Jakarta, athletes will start preparing for the next Asian Games in Hangzhou in 2022. It will be the third Chinese city to host the competition after Beijing in 1990 and Guangzhou in 2010. Won Zhongwan, Arirang News. Now, as a follow-up to that report, the South Korean head coach of Vietnam's men's national football team returned to Vietnam on Sunday to a hero's welcome. Park Hang So led the team to their best ever finish at the Asian Games, finishing fourth. With the red carpet rolled out at the airport, Park and his players were met by a large crowd of football fans welcoming them home. The streets of Hanoi were also packed with people waving Vietnam's national flag as thousands of fans, as you can see, gathered at a stadium to greet the team at a homecoming ceremony. The Saudi-led coalition in Yemen has admitted an airstrike that hit a school bus last month, killing dozens of civilians, was unjustified. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn uh, to our Noah Adam. So, Adam, it is exceedingly rare for the coalition to own up to these kind of wrongdoings. That's right, Mark. It comes after mounting international pressure, including from the coalition's own Western allies, to limit the number of civilian casualties in the Yemeni civil war. Last month's attack on the school bus at a market in Sadar province killed more than 50 people, most of them children. The U.S.-backed alliance at the time said the airstrikes targeted missile launchers used to attack southern Saudi Arabia a day earlier and accused the Houthis of using children as human shields. But in a statement on Saturday, it admitted that it made uh, mistakes, saying it will hold anyone responsible for the mishap accountable. The coalition's joint incidents assessment team noted that it had received intelligence that the bus was carrying Houthi leaders and was therefore a legitimate military target, but admitted that, uh, that the location of the strike had led to collateral damage. It added that delays in executing the strike and receiving a no-strike order should also be further investigated. The coalition also expressed regret and condolences to the families of the victims, saying it would work with the Yemeni government to compensate them. The US welcomed the statement, but human rights groups are not convinced and have accused the alliance of deliberately targeting civilians. Human Rights Watch on Sunday called last month's school bus bombing an apparent war crime, urging countries to immediately stop selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. 
The conflict between the coalition and Iranian-aligned Houthi rebels has been going on for three and a half years now and has claimed the lives of more than 10,000 people. Chinese President Xi Jinping is expected to offer African nations billions of dollars in aid and loans. President Xi is hosting the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in Beijing, where the leaders of nearly 50 African nations will gather. The event is being seen as China's apparent attempt to secure more allies and potential trade partners amid a bitter trade war with the U.S. In a meeting with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on Sunday, a day ahead of the gathering, President Xi reiterated that China is still determined to reform and wants to work with all parties to build an open world economy. The Chinese president is also expected to use the gathering to defend his belt and road infrastructure, which has faced some criticism recently for leaving countries that have joined with significant debt. The body of late Republican Senator John McCain has been laid to rest at the U.S. Naval Academy in Maryland. The burial caps a week of memorials for the veteran war, uh, Vietnam War veteran. Political heavyweights from both sides of the aisle gathered at his funeral over the weekend, with the exception of incumbent President Donald Trump. Relations between McCain and Trump have often been sour, and the late senator's family is said to have not wanted Trump to attend the funeral. During the memorial service, McCain's daughter Meghan took a thinly veiled swipe at President Trump, saying the America of John McCain has no need to be made great again because America was always great. President Trump, as expected, tweeted shortly after those comments, repeating his campaign slogan in block capitals, Make America Great Again. A 95-year-old man has broken his, old re his own record as the world's oldest scuba diver. British World War II veteran Ray Woolley took the plunge to explore a shipwreck off the coast of Cyprus. Woolley spent nearly 45 minutes underwater and said he hopes to break the record again next year. Good morning. Most regions will see another band of heavy rain for the start of September. In fact, Busan and Tongyeong County in Gyeongsang, Namdu province are already seeing downpours with heavy rain alerts being issued in those areas. And central regions will start to see showers from around noon with 50 to 100 millimeters of rainfall expected before the rain gradually spreads south. And heavy showers will sweep the country until dawn on Tuesday. And daily highs for the day should be similar or a couple of notches higher than yesterday, ranging from 24 to 30 degrees Celsius. Here in the capital, we'll get up to 26 degrees. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for beers around the world. Well, that's where we're going to leave it for now uh, on this Monday morning here in Seoul. Do stay tuned to Arirang TV. We've got plenty more uh, coming up, including our next newscast that's coming up at noon, Korea time with our very own E.G. Yoon. So until then, goodbye.